So yeah, I mean, the kind of the where I wanted to start was really kind of learning about your story and you kind of walk us through that for the people that don't know it. And I've done a little bit of research myself, but <laughs> it's always kind of really interesting to kind of start there. Well, I like to talk, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get it started. So basically, um, I grew up in Cheshire, so mm -hmm. not far from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of four kids um i'm the eldest i had a pretty normal upbringing um you know just school was fine everything was all right but basically um i started to struggle with school and i started to not be able to read the board and mm -hmm. uh, my teacher decided that i needed glasses and said you know libby's having a problem reading um and i was always pretty shy anyway i was always that awkward kid that like no one spoke to <laughs> <laughs> um, so i went to opticians and they thought you know what's you know I, I i didn't do very well with the eye test and they're like oh she's just shy she needs glasses and i went through a whole year of having to go through all these different test things and i eventually ended up getting diagnosed with my eye condition which is stargardt's macular dystrophy and for those people that don't know what that is it's basically old people get macular dystrophy when you know as they get mm -hmm. older but this is like in young people so mm -hmm. it's a loss of central vision and it gradually gets worse as you get older now I basically didn't really know what this meant. Um, I just knew that I couldn't see very well and it was going to get worse. And I had a lot of fun at the, the hospital because I, I was there that often I managed to memorise the, you know, or the, oh, <laughs> you know, the letters. The eye test. <laughs> <Yeah>. Amazing. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, it was pretty funny until they started using flashcards and I was oh. telling them letters and it was actually <laughs> objects. But, you know, it, <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of, it was just, I just did it to make it interesting. But I basically got diagnosed with my condition. Up until that point, I just didn't really have any knowledge of disabled people or what being disabled was or anything mm -hmm. and when I thought of disabled people it made me think of people in wheelchairs not mm -hmm. anybody else um but I absolutely love doing sport at the same time so even though I was quite shy um I was quite competitive so mm -hmm. the sports day and things I totally thrived on and yeah I just decided to join my local running club and that's really where the two sort of parts of me came together mm -hmm. so my actual name is Elizabeth, but no one calls me that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I basically, when I joined the running track and Kate had my eye condition, I became Libby and mm -hmm. that was it. Like it was just a new identity for me. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just felt really free and comfortable and um, I didn't feel judged by anybody and no one really knew what I was going through. And it was just quite a nice escape from being at school and at home because it was a lot for my parents to handle as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was, it was quite intense. And that's really where my road to my career started. And I started getting more involved in like disability sports, mm -hmm. um, which was a massive eye opener, by the way, <laughs> I had, the, you know, you see all sorts and even now like there's not really much that shocks me now but it, it was it was just um really interesting being exposed to that and I got to meet other kids just like myself as well mm -hmm. that were just normal kids that just couldn't see that enjoyed sports yeah. so it was great I mean firstly the the shyness with kind of the competitiveness that's a scary combination <laughs> like you don't want to mess with those people <laughs> um, I am um, it's actually like well known I you know, I'm like, when I go into competition mode, I literally just have a resting bitch face. It, yeah. My face literally is just like F off the whole time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but it is, it's sports done wonders for me over the years. And yeah, I, 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 lo I love it, to be honest. What kind of age did you kind of obviously be diagnosed and then kind of fall into that running club? So I got diagnosed, I think, in the summer when I, um, when, when I turned nine, just after I turned nine. Mm -hmm. And I just most athletics clubs don't let you join until you're nine so mm -hmm. I begged my my mum and my dad to let me go um and I, at that point I've been doing a lot of dancing mm -hmm. and you know dancing is very different from running <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah so I ended up just going to my local athletics club and that was it I just didn't really want to go dancing anymore it took me three years to stop dancing because I've mm -hmm. been doing it for a long time but yeah just gradually like the running just overtook the dancing and I mean it was just it was just great because athletics you get to try especially at that age as well you get to try all sorts of stuff so you get to throw and mm -hmm. you know you get to do jumping and you do the longer stuff you do cross country so it was great to just you've got so many different like elements to it and mm -hmm. it was it was more interesting than 
just dancing at the time. <laughs> when when did you know like sprinting was the one and then like obviously you took it to an elite level? So I think for me, oh, it was really strange. So I had been doing like 800 and 1500 meters mm -hmm. and I found it really hard. I basically, for both of those races, I would literally run like 600 meters and then sprint 200 meters. <laughs> I'd just jog and then I'd run. Um, and it was, I think I was about 14. Um, I actually got picked up on like a talent development camp thing. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that. And I just realized that I just enjoyed sprinting more. Mm -hmm. And it was getting to that point where you have to kind of make a decision what you want to do. And I thought, you know, what, I'll just have a go at sprinting. And to be honest, you, you're not, you know, it's out of breath as much. <laughs> the mm -hmm. training's different. It's, <laughs> it's more intense, but you don't get as sweaty and gross. Yeah, longer rest period. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like sprinters is 90% chat and like 10% work. <laughs> and I was like, I'm happy with that. Um, and I love that, the social element of it as well. So I was just like, it just felt really right to me. And it wasn't until I was 16. So at that point I was 14. Two years later, I was still doing these like development camps, not really getting any further, just sort of a bit mm -hmm. stagnant. Yeah. Um, and I got um, selected to go to the World Championships in Assen in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I was taken on a wild card. Like I did not deserve to be there at all. Yeah. I had not hit any standards to go. And they kind of just took me as a bit of a development athlete. And um, mm -hmm. I loved it. It was such a great experience for me. It's the first sort of really big competition I've been to. And it made me realize like how much I loved athletics. Mm -hmm. And basically this thing happened to me there, which was a massive turning point for me. So I was kind of like, like I say, it wasn't really that big of a deal. It was mm -hmm. very much like probably not going to make it. So I, my dad called me while I was there and he was like, ah. Oh, just letting you know, Radio 5 Live have mentioned you and they think you're a medal potential. And I was like, oh, okay. And like, I don't know if my dad was totally lying to me or what, but I was like, really like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like, mm -hmm. Radio 5 Live, believe in me. <laughs> it sounds really silly, but like, I was 16. I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. And I told one of my managers at the time and he, he literally was like, yeah, yeah. Maybe in 2012. And I was just, mm. just like, I literally just, like, my heart just sank. And I just thought, F you. Like, mm -hmm. how dare you say that to me? Like, you're supposed to inspire me and encourage me. And I just thought, I don't like you now. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up, um, I ended up um, doing, I think my first race was my 200 meters. Yeah, my 200 meters was my first event. And in one of my first heats had like the Paralympic champion and like world record holder. Mm, and I was wow. absolutely pooing my pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I knew I wasn't going to beat her, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to just stick with her for as long as I can and hope for the best. And that's just what I did. And I ended up like smashing uh, my 200 meter time by like two and a half seconds. No it was way. just incredible. I was yeah. absolutely just blown away. And it was then that I realized I, I am a performer. Like I like rising to the occasion mm -hmm. and I ended up beating all my times. Every round I ran, I ended up beating my time. And I was really fortunate because I run with a guide runner. Um, mm -hmm. I'll go on to that. A bit yeah. on, but I run with a guide <laughs> runner and um, my guide runner at the time was Lincoln Asquith. And he was like an ex GB, like Olympic athlete. Wow. So I had like a world-class guide runner on me, on mm -hmm. my, attached to me, giving me <laughs> like really good advice, but it was just phenomenal. And that was for me, the absolute turning point. I just thought, you know, I don't need anybody really to believe in me other than me to believe in mm -hmm. myself. And, you know, don't get me wrong. There's been times in my career where that has not happened. Sort of like forgotten mm -hmm. to believe in myself. But, you know, it was just, it, that was the turning point for me. And that's when I ended up just really focusing on training. At that point, I'd kind of been training, but not taking it too seriously. And then for me, that was it. Just like a, a switch was flicked and things just changed. <laughs> things that, changed. That's, that's crazy. Because like, just to kind of, obviously that experience is an experience and loads of people are going to see it in different ways. But to just kind of take that fear of, the, the, you know, all the lights on you and, you know, whatever and just kind of go this like I've got this like I yeah. put it on my shoulders I can deal with this this is what I can do like 
that's so rare <laughs> like <laughs> and it's something that's really you know, no one can really train you to do that like it's mm-hmm. not something that you can kind of learn um and it it's really interesting even now when i talk to athletes um some of them are like further on in their career and they're coming to the end of it. And some of them are like really young. You can tell who's going to make it and mm-hmm. who's not. And, you know, it can change if over time, but normally you can tell, I can, I can tell straight away whether someone's mm-hmm. got what it takes. And it's, it's really strange. And it's only because I've been through that like turning point. I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. like, yeah, like you've, you've got to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, then why should anybody else? Mm-hmm. So, and also if you're not going to invest in yourself, why should anybody else invest in you? Like you need to take care of yourself. So for me, it's like, for me, that was the biggest turning point. And I, you know, I don't regret, um, I don't, I do. I'm so glad my manager said that to me at the time because Mm -hmm. like it really, it gave me like the rocket fuel to to just, you know, stick my fingers up at them, to be honest, which is great. Well, we've talked about this so many times on the podcast, but it's like using the dark energy using the like the FUs, using all the things that have, people have doubted and put you in, just using that as energy because yeah. you can either use it as energy to drop, complain, moan, have a sulk, whatever, but there's still something to like, you know, to use. As people say use positivity the whole time and I'm a big believer. In... It doesn't always work all the time. Exactly. And yeah. that's, you know, using that fear and like, okay, I'm aware that I'm pretty pissed off here. I'm aware that this has really got to me. Okay, exactly. what am I going to do with it now? What am I going to use that for? It's it's really interesting. Like that was like the turning point, obviously at the start of my career. And then I went mm-hmm. on to Beijing in 2008 where like I won a silver medal in the hundred mm-hmm. meters. I was so happy with that just because it was my first Paralympic games. I was like, oh mm-hmm. yay, I've won a Paralympic medal. Like, and <laughs> each but but I genuinely like was just happy. Going into London, like it was a different experience again. Like, I was desperate to win a gold medal as mm-hmm. all I cared about. And I ended up winning another silver medal and I was <laughs> devastated. And it's really hard to explain to people like how that kind of feels. But for me coming second in London, then like mm. the, the last few years of my career um, going into Rio was just like, literally I started asking myself all these questions and the the crowd in London was phenomenal. Like yeah. it was absolutely unreal. It literally felt like eighty thousand people carried me around <laughs> the track. It was uh, it was just insane, and I loved the fact that the crowd was so supportive. They didn't care whether you came first or last. They were just cheering you anyway, mm-hmm. um, and it was amazing. But going from there, I ended up literally um, staying with my coach and like trying to work out what decisions to sort of make and Mm -hmm. it was really really hard because you have to really look at yourself and think about what I could have done better do you think you know that kind of obviously innate safe but self-belief you were talking about that what got you there do you think that really got shook after the London one and because that had come so naturally for you that then was shaken to your core and then you're like whoa this has come so naturally to me what do I do now well, that's it. And like, I've kind of been sailing through like, oh yeah, this is, mm-hmm. everything's like good. And then like in London, that just totally crushed me. I was, I was happy, but also crushed. Like, and it's, it's really strange feeling and um, I had to really look at myself quite hard. And I had this, I had a coach at the time and I got on really, really well with him, but there was things that I needed him to change and support me with for me to improve. And he wasn't the most supportive person with it. Mm-hmm. And I had to have quite a few difficult conversations and it, and it actually got to the point where um, I just sort of did what I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And then was like, you're going to kind of have to go with it. And it didn't really work out very well for me because I just mm-hmm. didn't have that support anymore. Um, there was some, a relationship, my coach then started to deteriorate. And then my relationship with my guide one at the time, Mikhail, um, who was my second proper guide runner, mm-hmm. um, that started to really deteriorate as well, um, just because I, I didn't feel like values and I, mm-hmm. and I didn't feel like my opinion mattered. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I don't have, you know, at that point, I still, you know, still need to make mistakes. Making mistakes is really good for you. And mm-hmm. for you to be successful, you need to fail at things and you have to learn by that. And 
that's a key part of it like failing and doing mm-hmm. things wrong is really mm-hmm. good for you um but like I, I was trying to explain to my coach like I just I want to change my strength and conditioning I need to like make sure that I've got enough iron and I kind of felt like it was all on me and I was trying to change these things that he was really rigid about me changing mm-hmm. And then I was having issues with my guide runner who was being really bad at the time, wasn't turning up um, Mm -hmm. for training sessions and all these things. And I just felt like really alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple of years. It took me nearly, well, it took me two and a half years after London to leave him. Mm -hmm. Um, So I ended up moving to my coach, um, Joe McDonnell, in the the March of um, 2015. Mm -hmm. And you know I felt like a piece of rubbish because my guide runner didn't want to move coaches with me he wanted me to stay with my old coach and he wasn't very receptive to that kind of change and mm-hmm. my, my new coach wanted lots of like had lots more expectation and put more ownership on him and it then just made our relationship get worse and worse and worse mm-hmm. and because I'd I started then picking up niggles because I wasn't happy. When you're mm-hmm. not happy, you don't feel good. And then you're not mm-hmm. running well. And all these things started to happen. So I was going into the World Championships in at the back end of that year. So it was in the October, November time of 2015. And things have been really rough between me and my guide runner. And I was loving my new training group. Absolutely loved it. Um, socially, for me, it was a lot better. Because um, I, I went back to sort of my roots. It was a club training group, like... There was no elite athletes there. Mm-hmm. It was just like really chilled and people were just there because they wanted to be there and they, they mm-hmm. loved the sport. And that's kind of what I felt like I needed at the time. So I went to the world championships and just before I got there, I got told like, you know, if you don't medal here, you're getting off, you're being taken off funding. Like we're not going to pay you anymore. You're not mm-hmm. going to be going to Rio. And I had all these injuries and I just knew, I just knew that was it. So I basically got on the track. Me and my guide runner had had a massive row a couple of days before because he'd not turned up on time. And it, it was only like five minutes late, but it was literally like the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. It was just mm-hmm. at that point. And um, I basically remember being on the start line thinking, I am not ready for this. Like, I, mm-hmm. I'm not mentally in a good place. I'm not physically in a good place. And I ran my first heat and my guide runner had not listened to any of the instructions that were discussed and just ran the race really badly and I ended up just it is really complicated but basically running the outside of a lane and it was just it just made me run like an extra five meters it was so mm-hmm. stupid we ended up having this massive round we got ready for the semi the next day the semi-final and in my warm-up my my calf just tore and I knew straight away and I just thought that's it it's done it's done like I'm, I'm finished um I basically got a scan confirmed that I'd torn my Soleus and I just knew I, I basically I got I went I went home early and I knew that was it then um I got a phone call two weeks later telling me that I was no longer to be funded then that basically means that they didn't believe in me mm-hmm. and I kind of was just felt I felt like completely alone mm-hmm. but my coach Joe McDonnell who who still coaches me now yeah. um was just like no we're gonna we're gonna sort this out we, you know you've got like eight or nine months and you're going to, you know, you'll just, if you want, you can just dedicate this eight or nine months and then you can quit. It's fine. You can just retire. But, you know, we've got to at least attempt to get the games. And he really believed in me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was still injured at this point And I was like, <laughs> what am I going to do? I was still going to a job that I'd basically yeah. been sacked from every day. I had um, I had to have a conversation with my guide runner to let him know that I didn't want to work with anymore, which was really heartbreaking because I'd had so many successes with him, but mm-hmm. I knew that our relationship had just come to the end of its road mm-hmm. and it wasn't going to go any further. So I had no guide runner. <laughs> I, I had I'd lost all my support services, all my medical support and everything. And I'd been taken off funding, so I wasn't getting paid. I was just like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> this is really mm-hmm. bad. And I remember my sister was in Australia on holiday with her, her now husband. And I just rang her at like two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thankfully, we were both on a network that meant we could have free calls. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just remember crying to her. And she was like, you'll be fine. And my sister's like the least athletic person going. She has no <laughs> idea anything about sport. And um, I just thought, you know what, like pull yourself together. You've literally got eight months. 
and then you're you can do whatever you want like you don't have to do it anymore and that was it I just decided to completely dedicate those eight months to me compete like getting even qualified Mm -hmm. to go to Rio and it was it was really difficult like I had times where I just wanted to give up I had times where I was still trying to recover from my injury but then I got this like little glimmer of hope because um my, my guide runner Chris Clark um basically he didn't know anything about guide running at all and his coach approached me and my coach about mm. him doing a bit of guide running with me because he'd also been taken off funding and was looking for another focus no way so it was just incredible chris he would admit himself is probably one of the most unreliable people <laughs> ever <laughs> he's the most non-committal person and when people found out that he was going to be having a go at running with me they were like oh it's going to be a disaster because he's just he's literally like you know off, off. he just wanders off and stuff and chats with other people it's so <laughs> distracting <laughs> um but we got together and it was just amazing it, everything just clicked mm-hmm. and for him it was you know he he doesn't like taking responsibility for himself but what didn't mind taking responsibility and supporting me and the partnership just absolutely blossomed and you know I just felt happier I was in a better place I thought you know what if I if I get to the games get to the games if I don't I don't get there and it and it's fine and I kind of became at peace with it Mm -hmm. but in the background I was doing all the little one percenters so I was making sure that I'd already started getting ready for heat preparation to go into Rio Mm -hmm my diet was right I'd researched all the things to do with like how to get back into the time zone quicker and all this Mm -hmm. kind of stuff I did all that research off my own back Mm -hmm. and so when I when I did get selected um I had to go to a squad weekend that I was bored out my tree at because I'd done all the research (laughs) (laughs) um and it was just such a good feeling because I just thought I'm more prepared than anybody else here and I Mm -hmm. knew I was more prepared and going into Rio I I knew that like I had done absolutely everything possible I could have done in that eight months Mm -hmm. um to be in the best position I could be in to pull out the best performance I could and I was just happy with that and I was content so when I got on that start line I was just like I said to like me and Chris I was just like Chris are we gonna like fuck these people up right (laughs) and he was just like yep and he's he's not like I was just like we're just gonna go and do this we're just gonna destroy them Mm -hmm. and that was it that was just the mindset we had and I knew it was in the best place to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> and what was the result for the people that don't know? I do know this. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris and I came away with a gold medal in both 100 and 200 meters and wow. world records. So we were very, very happy. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. it was it was way more than I ever expected. Um, and it was such a, I don't know, like, I don't want to sound really angry, but like we deserved it. We worked mm-hmm. so hard for it and um, mm-hmm. it felt really good. And, you know, it made me value like everybody else, my team as well. So I didn't just win it for me. Like I won it for Chris, my guides. I won it for Joe, my coach, who'd like mm-hmm. believed in me. Yeah. And then like, um, I had like a therapist, like a massage therapist that like literally fixed me. Mm-hmm. So Mike Allen was like my, a massage therapist I had a strength and conditioning coach that I paid so I just invested all my money mm-hmm. and these people just believed in me and they were there for me and um it was just amazing and all the people that I trained with you know that just turned up to the track every day they weren't getting anything out of you know helping me win a gold medal mm-hmm. but they were there for me and um, you know I massively appreciated that you're not just you know I think when a lot of athletes you just see them on the track and it's just them on their own and you don't realize what's such a like huge support team that you actually need and all the other little people that you forget about that are there Mm -hmm. encouraging you along the way and I was so lucky um to have all those people to support me so yeah it was amazing (laughs) what a journey what a story (laughs) that's it's crazy because like I, I kind of I thought it when you said it the first time on that kind of innate belief and then when that's shook to rock bottom what I immediately kind of thought was because I can relate to this so much is that okay that natural smoothness of it has gone for right now what am I going to do about it I'm going to do every single bit of preparation attack every one percent or every detail so that I can't in a way not have that like it just can't not be there And so you kind of, again, did that completely off your own back, the independence to do that as, in a way, like an elite athlete, there's no 
ego involved to say, oh, I'll get people to do this. I can find like, just I'm going to do this myself. And it's, 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 yeah, it's the opposite of the football world. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's opposite of the track world as well. Like I think mm-hmm. sometimes when you hit this sort of point in your career, you either just completely fail or mm-hmm. you rise above it and you've got a choice like you have a decision and I think it shows you like how much you actually want it and um, because when things are given to you it's easy you know mm-hmm. like getting therapy every week oh yeah get a massage every week if you don't need it though if you had to pay for it would you get it and if the answer is no don't get it you don't mm-hmm. need it yeah. and for me being taken off funding and not being a part of the team anymore was so good for me because it taught me accountability and ownership mm-hmm. and it taught me to like taught me to appreciate everything that I had and you know I started looking after myself a lot better and you know like the best person to look after you is you mm-hmm. like you are the best person for yourself so you know you're the one that knows what's you know good for you and what's not mm-hmm. good for you don't really need to be told mm-hmm. um so yeah it's, it's those one percenters that make such a big difference like just going to bed at like an hour earlier than what yeah. you would normally do or not sitting on your xbox for five hours like mm-hmm. it's not great for you <laughs> it's not great for your body it's not great for your recovery yeah. and yeah it's all these little things that like just add up and you know you think at the time that they're maybe not that important but actually they they really are um and you know it was for me it was really satisfying when um like people coming up to me after i'd obviously won and they were like oh my gosh Livy we knew you could do it and I was like no you didn't yeah no you didn't because if you thought mm-hmm. I could do it you wouldn't have kicked me off but I'm glad you mm-hmm. did because it's taught me mm-hmm. stuff that you would never have been able to have, like taught me mm-hmm. being funded so I was I was very happy um <laughs> that I could just be like no it's another f you to everyone yeah. again <laughs> um but yeah it was great and and now I feel I've got like a such a good sense of like who I am as a person and what my actual needs are as well and yeah I mean I'm just lucky that I'm in this position to be honest that I've experienced that because it it does you know it shows your resilience as a person as well and yeah it teaches all about that yeah 100 I think it's um like with the kind of the little presenters and all that like the people that are listening you have to sit down and work them out like okay this is best for me okay let's try this for two weeks let's try going vegan or going you know higher carbs blah 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 whatever it is sleeping early let's try these different things and sit down and actually do them because they're not you know they're not ridiculously complicated I don't know what kind of level of research and depth of research you went into (laughs) but you sit down and you do that and it's like you said, it's life changing. It changes so many things when it, it kind of seems so small. But those things are the commitments, but you've got to sit down and kind of work it out and listen to yourself, listen to your body. And it all starts with the awareness and then backing it up. Um, Definitely. You're right. And like, even like the little things, um, there's like these things called like geckos or fireflies. So when you travel, mm-hmm. they like, put like electric pulses and stuff through your your mm-hmm. legs so you help kind you like recover. a complex yeah 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 and so but they're like you can you chuck them away afterwards so okay. you know um but they're like little elastic bands and I so when I was like thinking about all this stuff that I needed like if I was going to compete like I had to make sure that I had recovery tights I had like mm-hmm. compression tights and like I, when I traveled I was literally like probably looked an absolute loon because I wasn't <laughs> you know I had like all this random stuff with me but I was like no I'm gonna be in the best position I'm gonna be and like even like after like really intense track sessions I was like just sticking my recovery tights on straight away and mm-hmm. and then I'd have like I had like three other pairs so I could rotate them so I could sleep in a pair if I knew Amazing. that I needed to like you know be fresh again for the next day and um I just sort of got my started getting my body used to all these things and mm-hmm. you know it's sometimes you just obviously everybody makes decisions that aren't the best at times and yeah you know it's what it is and and you know what sometimes going to bed at like three o'clock in the morning is fine you know <laughs> it's just like when in the title you know how that fits with your schedule it's not like the end of the world but you know it does have a knock-on effect and you do need to think about those things yeah um, I mean like weirdly I always find as well if I have one really bad like whatever it may be you go on a night out or you 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 know you stay up till three they're kind of every now and again really good because then I'm like the next day, shit, okay, this is not right. This doesn't feel good. 
Like, let's go back. Let's find the balance again. Because it reminds me that I'm off balance. And yeah. so, like you said, the little failures, the little like kind of realizations, oops, yeah, okay, I'm not in the right place here. Let's bring it back the other way. And, and sometimes you need a blowout though. Sometimes you yeah. need to get mm-hmm. rid of that. Um, because you know what? People, you know, athletes are people mm-hmm. and you can't be perfect and you have a personality and, mm-hmm. you know, wants and needs and whatever that is, you know, you should be able to do them every now and again. And um, I think people don't realize being an athlete is a lifestyle. It's it's not a job. <laughs> it's it's a lifestyle. You, you've hit the nail on the head of the podcast there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've completed it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think, do you, have you ever kind of gone through when you're in this phase and I can pretty much, yeah, I've been there, done that, got everything, <laughs> gone into every detail by myself. Um, and you get to this point where you're training ridiculously hard. Everything's bang, bang, bang. And do you ever kind of, did you ever get feel like the guilty? If you take a day off, would you have like, I'm because you're just such do, 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 do. I mean, I missed funerals. I missed Mm -hmm. weddings. I missed, you know, friends, parties. And, you know, it's not worth missing those events for people. Mm -hmm. Like it means more to those people than your session. It's not going to affect you massively Mm -hmm. having, you know, you know, taking a random day off in the week, you know, to go to a funeral. And I, you know, what? like looking back, like that was so shit of me to mm-hmm. do that. But I was just so like engrossed in what I was doing. I just mm-hmm. didn't sit back and actually like think, you know what, this actually isn't making me happy. Yeah. And you do need to have a balance. You need to do things that you enjoy doing and, you know, just be sensible about, sensible mm-hmm. about it. You don't, you, but you don't need to go to that extreme where it's just like, only talk about training only eating healthy all mm-hmm. the time like it's nice to eat a flipping mcdonald's every now and again <laughs> do you know what I mean? or yeah. you know get a, get a nice dessert like or you know mm-hmm. go for drinks with friends like it shouldn't control your life and mm-hmm. i think once i realized that that's not healthy to be like that all the time you just sort of learn to let go a little bit and you do you, like you're going to perform it to your best when you're at your happiest mm-hmm. and you know that's you can so be true. you can have everything you want um, when you're happy like you can be successful mm-hmm. and perform well um, and you can still eat rubbish or go to a party mm-hmm. and it's not going to massively affect you as long as you're not doing it all the time so yeah exactly and about that's true. balance see the only thing with balance is I feel like it's one of those taboo words kind of like happiness in that you're gonna like balance happiness they're like how you live your life like the key to it and I kind of like I'm always like hmm <laughs> like uh, like I've never found a perfect balance have no. you ever found perfect happiness like it's you not can't, a... it doesn't exist exactly. it doesn't exist you can be happy but like happiness isn't permanent it's not a yeah. permanent thing mm-hmm. and having balance isn't permanent like no. we live in like a world that's ever changing and yeah. mm-hmm. people people change you change you know you're constantly developing and growing as a person exactly. so the people around you and you know so you're never going to get a perfect balance it's just mm-hmm. it's nice to strive for that but like I've I've had points in my life that I'm really happy but then you know like two weeks later I might not be that I might be like no yeah. <laughs> and that's fine because that's life and you can't be on this permanent high it's it's it doesn't exist yeah exactly I think as it's kind of accepting, okay, like I always see balances, the look, looking for balance is just being aware of how like unbalanced you are, because it's <laughs> like, if you're like the start line here and that's like the end line, it's not going to be a straight line of perfect balance. It's going to be, let's say if like this way is going like too extremely hard working and this way is going like, you know, too like last lackluster and doing lazy stuff. And it's like, it's going to be like that. And you're going left to right, kind of working it all out going, oh, I need to recalibrate here. And then you go too far the other way and then you got to recalibrate and get the other way. And it's like, that's how it goes. And I think we're quite similar in the fact that, and I always remember this quote and I love it. And it's like, you must always go too far to find the truth. And I'm kind of like, that's kind of like what I do. I always take something way too far to the extreme, live by it for about a month or two and then go, okay, never mind. (laughs) Like, let's go the other (laughs) way. (laughs) Like, this isn't maybe the right thing for the rest of my life, but that's how I learn. And that's how you then find more balance in little things. And it's, yeah. <laughs> it's kind yeah, of like... It's, it's like, I know it sounds a bit like cliche, but it's like about finding yourself as well. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you've got like your performance side of you, but then you are a person as well, which is completely separate from, yeah. from athlete you. Mm-hmm. And it's really difficult because like I said, being an athlete is a lifestyle. It's not a job. And, 
everything is affected you know your whole life affects your performance so mm-hmm. it is really difficult sometimes to get those you know different sides of you to blend and yep. it does it's a massive learning curve mm-hmm. and even now like I've literally turned 31 and I don't know either <laughs> like, <I'm still laughs> uh, my life's crazy like some yeah. weeks it's like pretty chill and some weeks it's like craziness mm-hmm. and I just think you know but that's just life isn't it like it mm-hmm. teaches you different things so and then just like you know enjoy the ride control what you can control like you know strap into the roller coaster and let it go where it goes because like you're gonna know that I'm gonna always try my best I'm always gonna work my hardest I'm whether I'm meant whether it's a mental challenge whether it's a physical challenge I will give everything I can I'm gonna have weeks months days which are gonna be really difficult and I'm not gonna be like that but if I just keep you know I don't get off then I'm gonna keep going and yeah that's kind of the way to go and just accept all of these things and then go okay, I've accepted them. Like you said, with the kind of the funding and everything, accept that. Now, what am I going to do about it? Um, Yeah, that's it. mm -hmm. That's that's, that's just, I don't know. I think you just learn over time as well, like how to deal with those sort of situations. But it it, it, it doesn't either rise up or you you don't. Exactly. In that that year, obviously you rose up. (laughs) I did. (laughs) Where, where, (laughs) like where was that light at the end of the tunnel? Like, was it just the end result of getting a gold medal and qualifying and being there? Or was it like, I've got eight months to just enjoy, give it everything, get better, and then it will come. I think it was the eight months of just enjoying. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, like, if this is my last eight months, I'm just going to have fun with it and that's it. And I think it was like the anniversary games, which was in the july it was like the last qualification date for rio yeah and i'd already technically got the standards to qualify but this the anniversary games is such a huge event and um i thought this is an opportunity for me to showcase all the hard work that i've been doing Mm -hmm. and i absolutely annihilated (laughs) the, the field it was so good and i think then that for me even though it wasn't the paralympic games it's a bit like yeah I'm, I'm 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 all good i'm, I'm happy yeah. now i'm happy mm-hmm. um I, mean, I actually broke the world record in that 200 meters <laughs> I think. and i think i was just a bit like yeah i'm i'm, I'm satisfied like i i don't need any i don't need to prove anything to anyone at all mm-hmm. um and i was in a really good place there and i was just i was just happy i think i, I took a few days off after that and i was just proper chilled yeah, yeah just, just i'm I... gonna enjoy a few days and mm-hmm. you know appreciate the hard work i've done and yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, that was sort of it. That whole eight months going into that, I was like, yeah, this is, I'm just going to enjoy it. If it's my last eight months, it's my last eight months. I'm not bothered. <laughs> yeah. It really seems like obviously you had the environment and you built and changed that. And I think that's, that's really difficult in itself to get in and out of that, but it really kind of in the grand scheme of things from getting to that Rio and getting those golds was all about kind of <laughs> in a way <laughs> like like rebuilding the natural like i'm just gonna float through this and do this and finding that grit finding that resilience and it all being kind of internal and it all having to come from within you to go now this is the check like this is the difference between living it like this or living it like how i want to and i think so i mean i don't like obviously you're younger than me (laughs) and you're at the start of your career like when I was younger, I really struggled to be assertive and say what I wanted and what I needed because I was in the system. I was in mm. the, you know, it was with the national governing body. And I think when you're within that, you're very much controlled mm-hmm. and you're, you know, if you, if they don't agree with what you're saying, um, you know, they, you know, you look down upon or you feel mm-hmm. like there's going to be really bad repercussions. And I think a lot of the problem is, with athletes especially when you've been in that for such a long time is you don't realize that you actually need to make decisions for yourself to actually develop and grow as an athlete and it's really it's really hard to do that especially when you're young and you're mm-hmm. in that situation because you don't want to upset anybody you want to you mm-hmm. know you want you, you don't want to get a reputation for like yeah. being hard work or whatever <laughs> or being a bit difficult and I think it's just as you get older and you do develop more, you do become more assertive and you know, like, yeah, actually I want that or no, I don't want that. It doesn't work for me. I'm not going to do mm-hmm. it anymore. Um, and that only comes with like growing and yep. making mm-hmm. mistakes and thinking or having regrets even, you know, oh, I should have done that, mm-hmm. you know, I should have done that earlier or, I, 
maybe shouldn't have moved it to a different coach at that time or team or whatever and yeah I think it's sometimes it's just like owning your mistakes as well yeah there's, yeah. there's so many lessons in there <laughs> like there's, there's so many kind of independent self like intrinsic lessons that you went through that you just kind of learned the hard way but in a way that's kind of one of the only ways it's brilliant after Rio massive massive high probably you know the big dream that has lasted so long what was that like then afterwards when reality is like whoa <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah like obviously my my actual dream was just to win a Paralympic gold medal mm -hmm. not to never yeah. never even imagined that I'd ever win two Paralympic gold medals so for me it was an absolute dream come true and it felt really surreal like I didn't feel like it was happening to me mm -hmm. um and you know it was just phenomenal I got home I went on holiday for two weeks and I had about two months of time off because I really needed a break and I did something that I should never have done and that was get out of a routine mm. so my whole life uh, you know it's about getting up at a certain time to have my breakfast to then go training to then come back to do certain recovery and all this stuff and because I've been on holiday I stopped doing the stuff that I normally did so I got out of a routine and then I had too much thinking time mm. and when I was thinking I was just like because I'd literally just done athletics hadn't done anything else I then had this realization within about two weeks after I got back from a holiday, so probably about a month after the Paralympics, that was like, who am I? Like, mm. who am I as a person? And I just didn't know who I was. And then I started to feel really numb and that I didn't know my, who I was and I didn't have any feelings and I just felt really out of control and I just massively spiraled. And before, like, before I knew it, um, I was in front of our sports psychi uh, psychologist telling them, like, just bursting into tears, telling them that I just didn't, I didn't know what was wrong with me because I just mm -hmm. didn't. And everybody kept going to me, oh, you should be happy. You've won two Paralympic mm -hmm. gold medals. It's amazing. Like, you should be grateful. You should, you know. And I'm like, I'm a pretty humble person. Anyway. Like, if you came to my house, you wouldn't know that an athlete lived here other than the <laughs> fact that there's quite a lot of trainers. But other than that, you wouldn't know. Like, there's nothing in my house that would indicate to you mm -hmm. that an athlete lives there. And it's not sure that there's no. Are you sure there's no hidden trophy room? <laughs> there's definitely not a hidden trophy room. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's just really weird. Like, all my medals and all, you know, all the awards I've won are just put away mm -hmm. and it's not that I don't appreciate them or value them it's just I don't need them out to like for me to see them all the time yep. and you know people are like oh you should be really happy like I don't understand why you're not happy and I was just like I, I just don't care like it's not the most important thing to me mm -hmm. and but then I didn't know what was important to me <laughs> mm. um and then I was like I didn't want to talk about my achievements because then I then reminded me of this place that I was in and it was just this vicious circle and, it, and it, I ended up actually seeing a really good sports psychiatrist called Alan Johnson and he really sorted me out um mm -hmm. he started doing things with me like daily positive thoughts so mm -hmm. on those days I was really low and struggling he you know I had this like little these little tasks to do and um, just getting back into a routine really helped me as well and just yeah. actually telling people that I was miserable was actually really mm. good yeah. um, because you know I know there's a lot of things about mental health now and it's like you know you ask people how they are every day but you you genuinely don't really ask it's like oh you're right yeah I'm fine mm. oh you know you're okay yeah I'm all right and you know it's just like an automatic response but I was feeling terrible and I was really miserable and really unhappy. And um, I just didn't know how to express it. So I did all this work um, with him. And I'm going to be honest with you. It took me 18 months to, wow. to really get over it. It took me quite a while mm -hmm. um, to just sort of get to sort of my normal self. Even now, like this is like five years on nearly, four and a half years on it still left a, a bit of a scar with me. I'm still mm -hmm. not the person that I was then. Um, mm -hmm. And it has left its little mark on me. Um, but, you know, I'm mentally now in a much better place. And don't get me wrong, like, I, you know, I have days where I'm up and down and mm -hmm. like everyone else. But, you know, it was it was such a struggle. And I never thought achieving my absolute dream would cause me so much mental distress. Mm -hmm. And I think because I was such a mentally a strong person, 
I never thought it would happen to me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing. Like, I think people think, you know, just because you're mentally strong, it's not going to happen to you. But it literally mm-hmm. took me by surprise. And, you know, and I think it took everyone by surprise because just, I just didn't expect it. And then no one else did either. Was it kind um, of like an, like, maybe like an imposter kind of thing? Like, I've won this, wait, like, kind of like, you're not really accepting it and all these different kind of things. Was it surrounded with that? It was surrounded like that. And I felt like, you know, it's weird because... A Paralympic Games happens every four years and it's mm-hmm. literally, I've never taken, I've never even smoked a cigarette, let alone taken mm-hmm. drugs, but I'm presuming <laughs> it is like having a massive mm-hmm. hit of something. Yeah. And it's this huge high, like your entire body feels like it is just buzzing with energy. Um, and it is euphoric. It is a euphoric feeling. And that is why I, you know, have kept going, you know, every mm-hmm. game to get this like, hit yeah and it feels so good and then it is literally like a crash like mm-hmm. you've worked up your four years for this one event and then it is finished in two weeks and quite frankly no one gives a shit yeah they don't and it mm-hmm. and they'll they care for like a week and then they're not bothered anymore but mm-hmm. it means a lot to me and i've dedicated all my life to it and done all these things and and it yeah the medal's there but it doesn't really for me, it's not about the medal. It's not even about being on the podium. It's like that buzz of being in the stadium and mm-hmm. that like euphoric feeling of competing in front of 80,000 people. Mm-hmm. The, exp- the whole experience. And... The whole experience. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, like for me, being on the podium, it's like, I just thought I'm like, I, I'm, I'm starting to crash at that point anyway. Like, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I've got, I've got to be drugs tested now. I'm going to be another three hours before I get back to my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's that it's that hit and it and that's what like I chase as an athlete that feeling and and then it's gone mm-hmm. and then you know you're not going to have it for another four years and then you start getting in your head too much and mm-hmm. sometimes it's you know great to have a really good think and then sometimes it's it's you know sometimes it's quite good not to go that deep into yourself because then you start questioning things that you wouldn't necessarily normally question yeah. um but yeah, it was it was rough. It was really, really rough. And then for me, like even now, so like obviously I was hoping the Paralympics were gonna happen last year because <laughs> you know, I'm looking at like calling it a bit of a day, I'm getting old. Um <laughs> but I ended up like I really wanted to have a family, so I made mm-hmm. the decision to have my little boy. Mm-hmm. Um you know, in between Paralympics, yep. uh, between Rio and Tokyo. <laughs> and you know, I just thought this is something that I really want to do, I want to have a family. Um, and he's given me another purpose in my life as well, you know, so I, you know, I'd love to go to the Paralympic games and win another two gold medals, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, like, even if I go there and say, I come dead last, but I know I put my best performance in, I won't care because mm-hmm. I've got some, somebody, um, bigger than all of mm-hmm. this, like that mm-hmm. just is that my absolute world. Um, so I'll just be happy anyway because I've got him mm-hmm. and he, he makes me smile on a daily basis. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I'm just like, oh gosh. <laughs> it's hitting the terrible twos, he's two in a couple of weeks and oh, oh my gosh, I know it. Um, <laughs> but you know, it just gives me a different like meaning to my life as well mm-hmm. and it kind of puts things into perspective. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it, my life's changed a lot since then. Um, but yeah, I was t- so gutted the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. I was like, Tokyo, come on. <laughs> you still, I'm assuming you're still participating. Is it later this year? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, we've, that's if we can compete. Because <laughs> yeah. all our competitions have been um, are a bit iffy at the minute. Everything yeah. keeps getting cancelled. But hopefully, I'd, I'd love to compete in Tokyo this year and. Um, which would be really, really good for me. My my partner Dan, who's Edward's dad, he's yeah. a, he's a Paralympic judo athlete. No way. So he should be going. But then also one of my brothers is a Paralympic swimmer. So nice. I, it's like a bit of a family <laughs> affair, really. So kind of I'm, I I want to make sure that I'm there to support them too. Mm-hmm. Amazing. With kind of this whole recent journey with you know the mental kind of dealing with all that, you've obviously had to rebuild yourself completely. What was it like kind of, obviously if you've got the, you know, you've got your son, you know, coming up and that purpose, but in terms of your identity, yourself, your kind of, this is who I now 
am and this is how I'm going to be? Did you have to let go of a lot of stuff? Did, how did that whole battle with rebuilding kind of go? I kind of had to sort of start doing things that I enjoyed like outside of the track and like having something mm. else other than just athletics because it's not healthy to just only have your sport because you know when you get injured and stuff you need something else to focus on because you don't want to just sat there thinking about an injury like it's just something that you'll keep going round and round and round in your head um, having something else going on as well whether it's like I volunteer once a week over at a community centre in Leicester and I mm. absolutely love it and you know th- these guys they're not athletes at all they're just the people <laughs> I work with then they don't do sport or anything like that but I've got a different skill set that I can sort of help them with like goal setting and yeah. you know g- giving them you know showing them that they can have opportunities and you know they can get them and things like that and I really enjoy doing that just because it it makes me feel good and it's something that I look forward to every week that's not related to the track I don't have to talk about athletics or training or what I've been eating Mm -hmm. um and you know it makes me feel good and I, I, I love it and I think it's having those little things outside um of your sport that really help you they help you grow as a person in different Mm -hmm. ways and it is good to have a more dynamic outlook on life than just very focused on on track all the time or apart from that you got any other kind of hobbies that you started oh i started doing fitness classes in the evenings nice um i do online fitness classes i'm not I've got it. Be nice. I should have done it earlier on in lockdown because I got a bit <laughs> fat eating loads of biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> but I started. Um, I started doing these fitness classes three three times a week, and I love it. I love doing it in the evening. I've got like mm-hmm. a few people that come on, and mm-hmm. I like just chatting to them, and it gives me Amazing. something to look forward to as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and you know, chat about rubbish as well. <laughs> it's quite nice <laughs> while exercising, and it keeps me going. And I think obviously once I do retire, it'll encourage me to continue to do some level of exercise mm-hmm. otherwise i would definitely be a couch potato <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it, it's funny because i went kind of through the same thing hence why the podcast exists and stuff like that outside because you you know you live your life you know especially in football nine till two and i don't know what your training plan is but obviously you've got recovery and you can always do a bit more but the rest of it normally is spent you know most people watch tv going on the xbox whatever it is and it's like hmm like I've got half a day and like, that's a lot, like that's, that's a lot of time and I'm not going to spend it on my phone or on social media or whatever. So what am I going to do with that? And then with that exploration, like you said, growth as a person and just kind of, there's so much there, like <laughs> there's so much out there that you can do and try and learn. And for me, those experiences where you're open to something and all these different things, it's really cool, but it comes from like that kind of, and we've talked about this throughout the whole thing. It's not being like, oh, I'm an athlete. This is all I do. Okay. Like, let's be, let's be able to switch between I'm an athlete, but I'm also incredibly good at like, I'm also want to try this. Or, you know, you could say some people say I'm really smart, but can you also be really naive and stupid in some areas and happily admit that and be really open because otherwise you're never going to grow. And otherwise you're never going to experience new things. And you as you identify yourself, you're going to be stuck in that box for the rest of your life and just kind of stuck there. And that's yeah, it. That's it. You're right. You're totally right. And I think, when you're in like the sporting world you become quite Mm narrow-minded and like like I'm like you I train like literally nine till two that's literally it Mm -hmm. and then you do you have the rest of the day and if you don't it all then your friends all become friends within the sport because Mm. your other friends don't necessarily finish work at two (laughs) o'clock um (laughs) and then you know you start to like you know it's just it then becomes a bit of a vicious circle you suddenly get sort of stuck in this cycle of like being friends with the same people hearing the same chat and doing the same stuff Mm, and it is mm. great to just do other things and get other experiences no matter what that is like so sometimes sometimes i've gone and done school visits um, amazing i I tried to do voluntary work at like a dog's trust thing (laughs) I, d- I really enjoyed doing it, but I can't drive and it was really far out. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't actually get there. It's yeah. it's a nightmare. <laughs> um, but I tried different stuff and I just thought, you know, I don't know what if I like it or not. And, um, you know, you do need to sort of find yourself. I really like helping people. Like I mm. really love helping people. So, you know, any anywhere I can do that, I'm like, I'm well up for sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But like, like I say, the voluntary work I've been doing over in, in uh, Leicester, the community centre, 
like I'm exposed to people that I would never have been exposed yeah, to exactly. and it makes me realize like how naive I am like some some of the people that I work with you know from really deprived backgrounds and have you know absolutely nothing and I just think oh if I can just even have a conversation like a cup of tea with them mm-hmm. and like make them feel better then you know that's yep. that's good I'm happy um, but it just gives you a bit of a reality check as well, which is good. Exactly. You know, and, what and real I'm, life is actually like. <laughs> and there's this big stigma around athletes being really selfish and like the world revolves around you because you've got to be like that. You've got to be cr- like, you know, cutthroat, hungry, like black and white, whatever. But the situations where, you know, once that's done or once you succeed or fail or whatever, then you get hit with those reality checks. And, like you know, like after Rio for you, you kind of like, wait, what? Like, what? this is the world doesn't revolve around me like (laughs) and like that is the big thing is that the suffering that we all go through is very much about because we're so worried about ourselves. I was so self-conscious and so self-centered and I'll say this quote a million times on this podcast but self-centeredness is the source of suffering and like you said the voluntary work the humility you have when you talk about your team and how you brought them all together around you to create your environment and you know, I've, you've, that's a big part of you as a person yeah. and you meant your mental health as well. I mean, so someone, someone told me this once and I was like, it's so true. They were like, what goes up has to come back down. Mm-hmm. And depending on how nice you are on the way up, it depends on how hard you're going to fall. Oh, <laughs> and like it's that. so true. It is so true. If you are horrible to people on the way up to your success, that fall when you you're not going to be successful because everybody has peaks and troughs in their life Mm -hmm. if you are horrible that fall is going to be pretty nasty because no one's Mm -hmm. going to be there to catch you yeah and if you're kind to people and you treat people with respect on the way up to being successful when things are rough and things are hard which inevitably will be because nobody Mm -hmm. does have a smooth ride you know there'll be people there to soften the blow yeah and it's so true it it really is Mm -hmm. so I don't like, I, I don't think it's good for athletes to be selfish. You do, there needs to be some level and an element of selfishness, but yeah. it doesn't need to be like completely self-obsessed. Um, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I definitely. It doesn't make you a good person. <laughs> and then even with obviously with you in, in, in sprinting, which is obviously a very individual sport, you've, you've brought on to the, you know, your guide runner. And yeah. that's a crazy thing to me to even like contemplate that, like, <laughs> running and synchronization like all these different things that must go into it the teamwork the communication like yeah how does that work it's, it's absolutely <laughs> insane so um it's basically like doing a three-legged race but attached to the wrist rather than at the foot yeah. and it takes a lot of communication and trust and you know it's one of those things that i'd like to say it takes hard work but it doesn't it it either works or it doesn't it's, it's literally it clicks or it doesn't click and that's it so it's pretty straightforward in terms of that. But, you know, finding the right person to run with is difficult. And it is on a personal level as well, because you have to spend quite a lot of time with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you go away on camps together. You're training with them every day. And when you're not getting on with somebody, the last thing you want to be doing mm. is touching somebody. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, so it's really important to have that relationship with them as well, where you do have a friendship that you can tell each other what's going on in case you are having a bad day and you, you know, yeah. you're feeling a bit prickly. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to be able to communicate that with them or, yeah. you know, if you're, they're upset you, you need to be able to go, look, you've really annoyed me. Like <laughs> you're late mm-hmm. <laughs> again. Um, so you know it's it is really 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 important and it yeah it's one of those things that you you fine tune it either it works or it doesn't work but then it's just a bit of fine tuning and Mm. yeah that that trust and communication element is just as important as that physical element um, because the two need to really work together yeah it's ridiculous (laughs) i I saw that in the rear one you also had to run with a blindfold was that different to the kind of the ones before and that that sounds scary like yeah <laughs> do you know it's really strange so like but chris honestly mm-hmm. like i don't want to be mean but he is like scatty he's totally <laughs> he's like really distracted like yeah but, like, like a little puppy yeah 100 <laughs> percent um and like but he's so good like when we're working together he's like focused like he's like mm-hmm. yeah this is what we do and he sort of switches it on it's amazing and when I realized that you know I was gonna have to use a blindfold um I was a little nervous working with Chris doing this (laughs) he could just like pull me over and I'm gonna fall flat on my face Mm -hmm. um 
but he's he's so attentive and really supportive and I just thought do you know what like I've just got to give it a go and yep. um yeah when, the first time we ever did it I was I was pooing my pants a bit but yeah literally like the first couple of steps we came out the blocks um which is terrifying within itself mm-hmm. um and yeah it just it, it just was felt so reassuring and mm-hmm. I felt like it completely had my back and it was it was such a nice feeling so actually when I ended up running with my blindfold I just felt oh no actually I'm okay like it's not gonna yeah. let anything bad happen to me yeah um so yeah it, it the, wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be <laughs> the, the degree of trust in that is yeah is pretty it's pretty special like I always remember like the little kids in playgrounds when one person has to wear a blindfold the other person can and just like you know the amount of like injuries that are occurring let alone <laughs> sprinting as fast as you can around the track like, it's, it's 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 yeah it's really like wow and it's weird. it's really interesting because um so every, everyone thinks like Chris sort of guides me or the guy mm-hmm. that guides me but like it's a lot of it comes from me mm-hmm. translating what I need from them um and it is like we communicate a lot together because we were like, oh, you know, just like basically pulls you around. I'm like, no, no, no. There's like a lot of different little, really sort of small, really important bits of information that we get from one another. And it's and it's little like arm movements. He knows what my arm mo- movement means. I know if he lifts his hand slightly higher when we're running that we're coming into a different phase of our race. And it's little no things way. like that. Mm. Yeah, and it's you know and he knows whether like I'm tired or not and Mm -hmm. it's a it's a complete two-way sort of communication that goes on um and like it's really strange even though I obviously can't see very I am very good at teaching people how to guide one so like when people like oh can I have a go I'm like yeah yeah and I'll be like like you put the blindfold on especially if this like it's empty it's no nobody around (laughs) the track's empty I'll be like right you put the blindfold on and I'll show you how to do it yeah um and it's weird because people really trust me i'm yeah. just like God. <laughs> um but yeah it's like it is it's a it's a two-way sort of communication thing and it's like a it is literally like a synchronicity like yeah as you you are literally like one person it's really weird um it, 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 yeah it's it's to compete at that speed and that level of performance in unison it, it's it's a crazy kind of it is it's, it's, it's crazy. crazy yeah a lot of people have like I've said to me what's it kind of like and the only thing I can kind of like equate it to is like like maybe ballroom dancers you know where they mm-hmm. know each other yeah. so well that they can just they just sort of flow mm-hmm. um together it's kind of like that but obviously just running <laughs> running <laughs> amazing um different kind of question and to look at everything that you've kind of been through in a really broad way what would you say you are most proud of because from what I can tell already it's been a hard one where you're hard to kind of give yourself like that proudness but what would you say is do you know what this is a bit of a weird one but so I am most proud of the fact that after I had my son I Mm -hmm. came back to training after four weeks of like having a cesarean and it's not like a performance related thing but I was just like you know, I, I knew that I wanted to, after having all those mental health issues, I knew that I wanted to have my have my son and then come mm-hmm. back. But I didn't know whether I was really going to be able to do it because I didn't, I thought I might emotionally change and it might not, I might not want to do it. Mm-hmm. And I was so determined to come back to the track and I'm most proud of being back after four weeks and then literally mm-hmm. not even six months later competing at the world championships. I didn't run particularly well. <laughs> I was just so proud of myself that I actually got there. Um, So yeah, that was my like proudest moment, even though it wasn't necessarily like success on paper. Yeah. No, but I think that kind of, for me, that, that seems like it's kind of the story of everything that you've, whatever it's been, you've just kind of got back up and got like, got back to the track and got on with it. And, you know, you go to the cliche, like Rocky ones. It doesn't matter how hard you hit him at hard, (laughs) like if you get up, like how hard you can get it and you get up. And that just seems like the embodiment of how many times you've got back up and carried on. And, you know, to me, that's why that is success. And that is, you know, a resilience that isn't defined by a gold medal or isn't defined by a time, but it's a self kind of like, this is who I am. This is what I do. And that inner confidence, that inner belief that comes from getting back up. That isn't, from you know running a pb or doing this or whatever that is you know it's, it's an experience thing it's a knowing that 
this is who I am. This is what I've done. It's not just a external kind of thing. It's all come from within. So that's, it makes a lot of sense that that would, that would be what you're most proud of in a way. Yeah, I know, definitely. Um, for the people that have made it this far in the conversation, because <laughs> um, we've gone at all... I'm not all... bored to death. <laughs> no, it's, I've, I've, I've certainly been on the edge of my seat. <laughs> um, if they're going through mental health and if they're struggling in lockdown, because obviously, you know, everybody's kind of been through that point, even myself with football, even though it's luckily stayed on pretty much, there's still been times where you've not been playing and then you're kind of like, what do I do now? And you lose all that. And it's the mental health, obviously, from yeah. being athletes or even just normal people is obviously on, you know, on the rocks. What would you say to anyone with your experience going through or even what you would say to yourself in this moment? What would it be? I would definitely make sure that you tell your friends or your family what you're going through because at the end mm-hmm. of the day they love and care about you and they mm-hmm. want you to be happy and I think sometimes just telling somebody it's like an admission and once you've told somebody it kind of it doesn't make you feel better but you're sharing it with somebody else and I think that like can take a bit of the weight off you mm-hmm. the other thing I would recommend would be like I say I did daily positive thoughts um and that was really helpful and it just made me find the pleasure in little things in life Mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be anything like that you've done that's amazing it could be you know I've had a cup of coffee sat in my garden Hmm. and it was sunny and it felt good and like those little things that you forget about in in the day um you know that or you you know you could learn something new or you know you go for a walk and you see a friend like those little things just to keep a hold of them especially when you're feeling really low because you you do tend to think about all the like negative things so doing one of those every day and the other thing I think is so important when you're mentally not in a great place is having a routine so making sure that you Mm -hmm. get up and have your breakfast and have a shower in the morning and doing things that make you feel good um Mm -hmm. it's really really important um just because it you know those days when I just didn't even want to get out of bed and I wouldn't wash for like three or four days Mm because it's just wallowing in Mm -hmm. complete and utter despair and yeah just getting up and having a shower and getting something to eat and having that little set routine at the beginning of your day makes a massive difference because then you're, you're up then and you're out and you're ready. Um, 100%. So yeah, that's, that was be like my bit of advice, but also success looks different to everybody, you know, mm-hmm. you know, success is different to different people. And, you know, I think it, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is, is, you know, if you're happy with something you've achieved or even something that someone else has achieved, like my, my most, happiest thing for me like this is really sad but like I was so happy that my son I got told by nursery that my son had given a child a hug when they were upset uh-huh. and I was just like that's just made me so happy like mm-hmm. you know it, so like those little things that can you know that seem insignificant that are really important mm-hmm. and make your day so yeah yeah I, I mean on those that those little things if you've got the expectations where little things can make you happy and you can be grateful for them Life gets a lot easier it's if it's just the little easier. things that makes you happy because the, 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 the expectations aren't up here that I'm only going to be happy if I do this. But if they're just little things, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot easier. And that's just a, it's just a de- you know, definition or whatever it is of perspective. It's, it's just how you see it. And we can all do that. That's anyone can do that right now, starting tomorrow. So Definitely. 100%. And last question we wrap up every episode with would be, what makes you more than a runner, an athlete? What makes you human? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> Everyone says that. Oh, such a difficult question. Um, do you know what? I think I think we put athletes and celebrities even on mm-hmm. a pedestal. And actually you just you're just good at your job. Mm -hmm. you know you're good at something you're just like everybody else you've got the same problems everybody else has Mm -hmm. you feel the same things as everyone else as you you're as an athlete you're no different from any other person and I think I think actually just being normal (laughs) um well and and everyone's normal is different I think everybody's weird on some level or (laughs) or another anyway (laughs) um but yeah it's just about I I think the only thing that makes a difference is is that you're you know good at something that's in the public eye or Mm -hmm. whatever you know there's so many other people that are achieving so many other things in all walks of life it's just sometimes people are just noticed a bit more yeah yeah, I'm, i'm just a normal person like everyone amazing 
you, you're certainly very humble I'll give you that <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. but yeah it's it's been an absolute pleasure you're st- hearing your story hearing your advice and you know kind of how you went through everything's really inspi- inspirational I'm full of I'm inspired myself so <laughs> <laughs> no the thing is though like for me like if my story inspires you that's amazing but I'm just being me mm-hmm. and every everyone has got their own story mm-hmm. and I'm just a normal person at the end of the day I just I, I just can't see very well which makes me a bit different from other people mm-hmm. and I've just got a cool job um mm-hmm. that people get to see yeah. um but you know it doesn't make any me any better than anyone mm-hmm. else yeah amazing wow well thank you ever so much for coming on it's been a brilliant conversation I've jo- enjoyed all of it it's been great thank you for having me I've, re- I've, re- I've really enjoyed it myself too <laughs> <It's great. laughs> thank you very much Bang. Let me 